I'll join in thanking our program sponsors. This panel is brought with the support of Finnish Literature Exchange, the Barbro Osher Pro Suecia Foundation, Culture Ireland, the initiative Wunderbar Together, initiated by the German Federal Foreign Office, the Goethe Institute, and supported by the Federation of German Industries. Goethe's Institute Translation Program, Books First, the Consulate General of Switzerland in San Francisco, and Pro Helvetia. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our wonderful panelists. Thank you for coming out from <laughs> Europe to, to speak to us. Um, I'll start with Laura Lindstad. Laura Lindstad became a critical darling with her adoption-themed debut novel, Scissors, which earned her a nomination for the Finlandia Prize, the country's most prestigious literary honor. She's currently revising her PhD thesis on French author Nathalie Sarot. Lindstad's second novel, Oneiron, is a work of speculative fiction that takes place in the mysterious moments that follow one's death. Oneiron has continued Lindstedt's critical success, earning her the coveted 2015 Finlandia Prize. Oneiron is a, uh, about seven women from different cultural and linguistic backgrounds. The setting is an empty white space or bardo, and the women are sharing the stories of their lives told in different formats. The women are Shlomith from New York, Polina from Moscow, Rosa Immaculada from Brazil, Nina from Marseille, Vlipkes from the Netherlands, Maimuna from Senegal, and Ulrike from Austria. Our next author is uh, Mike McCormick, who's an Irish fiction writer and novelist. He's published two short story collections, Getting It in the Head and Forensic Songs, and three novels, Crow's Requiem, Notes from a Coma, and Solar Bones. We'll mostly be talking about Solar Bones, which was long listed for the 2017 Man Booker Prize and won the Goldsmiths Prize. Solar Bones takes place in Ireland, and it's about a middle-aged engineer, Marcus Conway, reflecting on his life on All Saints Day. We get to see all the elements of existence that built his life in a novel-length continuous sentence. Dorothy Elmager is, Elmager is on the end, and she is a Swiss writer currently living in Zurich, Switzerland. She studied history, philosophy, and creative writing in Switzerland, Berlin, and Leipzig, and is the author of the novels Invitation to the Bold of Heart and Shift Sleepers. She's received several awards, including the Eric Fried Priest, the Swiss Literature Award for the year 2014, and the Max Frisch Forte Price 2018. Her writing has been adapted for the stage and translated into several languages. Shift Sleepers is partly a conversation and partly made up of monologues in which a translator, a writer, a logistics expert, and others talk about their experiences of place, migration, asylum, escape, searching for happiness, and living there in conversation, but not necessarily speaking to each other at all times. <laughs> um, and I thought I, we would start out, you know, I think um, there are, each of our authors is coming from different uh, cultural and literary tra traditions. And so I, I think you know, literary bravery is often contextual to the society, so I thought we'd ha start by having each of our authors um, sort of introduce themselves by what their own definition of literary bravery is. Um, I would say that uh, it's brave to even write because nobody asks us to write at all. It's not kind of necessary thing to do. We have to do something in this world and eat and sleep and such a thing and work normally. Something about uh, writing is not that kind of thing, so to start to write is, is a bravery thing. And of course, when you have written something, for example, actually I do have a third novel as well, which uh, was published a month ago in Finland, so it's quite new. My friend Natalia, it's not translated in any languages yet. But if you have read one book and two and three and etc., then I would say that it's brave to try not to follow what you have already done, but really think again and and uh, try to write as you would write your first novel all the time again. So you don't kind of know how you have to learn how each time you write. Uh. I think I have a very similar answer, actually. I think that every subject matter and every maybe pool of material that one assembles asks for a very specific 
own way of telling a story, um, of writing about it. And I think for me, bravery is to really start anew with every text, um, to question all premises again, as if one didn't know anything, um, and to learn to write again and again and again. Um, I suppose for me, um, artistic bravery or writerly bravery is to try and willingly set yourself the task of saying something that has never been said before or saying it in a way that has never been said before. In some way or other, expanding the received form, the, the novel goes back. The novel goes back hundreds of years and frequently there's mentions of crisis in the novel. So we, we always live in some sense with the novel as this kind of jaded um, animal. But so therefore there is this responsibility on us to redeploy it, rethink it, reconfigure it, and get it to say things that only a novel can say. There's no use as being philosophers, there's no use as being sociologists, there's no use as being psychiatrists or whatever. We're novelists, I'm a novelist, so I do the things that only a novelist can do. And I would like to think that got, I come from a tradition of experimental writing. By that, I mean I'm an Irish writer, and our great writers are our experimental writers. Joyce, Kafka, <laughs> Kafka. <laughs> <laughs> Joyce, <laughs> Kafka. <laughs> Joyce, Joyce Beckett and Flann O'Brien are three. That's our, that's our, that's our, those are our, our, our Olympian figures. And they all have gone to some effort to expand out the received form. And um, being an Irish writer, I, I, I take that responsibility seriously and would like to think that I certainly don't have the, the big epic um, swathes of imagination that those men had but I would like to think that in some way my work belonged in that camp and was of that ilk and inspiration. Thank you. That's, that's really great. And I think your book, book does fit very nicely within that tradition. It's a, it's a beautiful book. So all of your three of these books are amazing. I didn't show them to you for, at first, but this is Mike's book, Solar Bones. This is Laura's book, Oneron. And this is Dorothy's book, um, Shift Sleepers. So these are all gorgeous books and they'll be available afterward. I thought we would also, just to give you all a sense of their writing, we would start with, each of them will read um, you know, four, four to five minutes of, of their novels. Just so you get a sense of like when we're talking about substantive things, <laughs> you'll be able to like have an idea of where they're coming from. So Laura, start? do you want to okay. <clears throat> This is the second part of my novel, In the, in the End, and this white space these uh, pe women are when they have already died, but they don't know it yet, uh, they have to go further. They have really learned how to die. And that is the story, <laughs> story of the book. And this is the moment when they kind of find the way how they proceed their dying and, and find the rest of mind and peace. And it happens uh, with the help of this magical word, oneiron. Very slowly, without moving, Shlamit appears next to the women, next to the sheep spinning its wheels in the sand, her toes lightly in the air, her calls near the exhaust pipe. And thus the row is complete again. The row that Paulina broke once before, which Paulina refused to join because she was afraid, because she didn't have the courage, after all, to give up the familiar, safe whiteness, when she opened her eyes and started to talk. The row is as beautiful as the most beautiful funeral procession, as sad as the saddest tune, as comforting as the embrace of Mother Earth. The row is complete. The women are not afraid. There, somewhere, a moment ago, an eternity, a second ago, they looked at each other once again. Maimona at Blipkis, Blipkis at Polina, Polina at Shlomit, Shlomit at Nina, Nina at Ulrike, each at each. They looked, but in a different way than before. No suggestions, no questions, 
no raised eyebrows, no nervous glances or shrinking of responsibility. They checked like soldiers preparing for a charge, checked that everyone is completely present, completely awake, that everyone is aware of the command about the calm down, the command that they must all execute at exactly the same moment. With their gazes, they must clear to everyone and to themselves that no one would slip away from the group, that no one would sink into her own thoughts and fall behind. It was time to say goodbye to the white. Whence this sudden certainty and unanimity? We don't know. There are many things that are not within our control. Again, we are forced to surrender. And it always feels just as crushing, as if we are never going to learn anything from the thousands and thousands of departures, from being left alone and from new arrivals, as if the people who appear here individually or in clusters, scrunched up or with limbs outstretched, startled or fast asleep, who disappear after their time is through, aren't a natural part of this cursed process. The women look each other, took each other by a hand, and formed a circle. If there was any fear, there was more curiosity. If there were doubts, there was more will. The moment had come, and they knew it. The universe, with its layers of time, its dimensions, its hidden pockets, its concealed folds, and its obscure wrinkles seem to gather around them, hold its breath, and wait. Then, somewhere something began, to deep, began a deep kettle drum beat like a giant heart. And so it came to pass that suddenly, after forming their circle, the women felt themselves begin to throb as well. They felt the rhythm within them, the pulse pounded in their hands and fingers, which were clutched, unfeeling, in other hands and fingers. Then they had a rhythm, a superfrequency pulse, and it urged them to depart. So they closed their eyes and said, each in her own way, out loud or just moving her lips, on a ron. And nothing prevented them from saying it through to the end anymore. On a ron. And no one curled up halfway through the word. And no one turned tail. And no one decided she wanted something else. On a ron. Hands disengaged from hands at the final syllable. Ron. Fingers straightened, springing open. Ron. And there was no going back. Mike, would you like to okay. go next? This is, uh, <coughs> this is Marcus Conway. Marcus is in his early 50s. He's a public engineer. And he's speaking here about his father, his beloved father, and what happened to his father after his, uh, his wife died. And he, this will just give you, I, I suppose, po probably a, a feel for the rhythm of the book. And it says, in no time at all, his strength and his resolve was undone. He slackened and lost interest in the world before withdrawing completely to the house with the dog where in the half-light of those narrow rooms behind drawn curtains, his confusion and his grief deepened to that fatal awkwardness with which there is no talking to, so that very suddenly he grew angry and rancorous, and he fell out with myself and Ethna, and he took against us with such sudden vehemence in those weeks after Ani's funeral that we'd no time to fathom its proper cause, but we were nonetheless left in no doubt by his rage that some shameful blame had accrued to both of us for some reason or other because... When we went to see him, he dismissed us from behind the closed front door, telling us to leave and not to come back, and calling us a shower of cunts, 
and nothing but his curse upon us that day, with both of us standing there looking at each other in disbelief, not knowing what to do. And when I took a walk around the house, I saw he had the curtains drawn in every window and the back door locked with no way in. So there was nothing for it but to leave. We'd come back. We'd try again in a couple of days. But then he sold off all the livestock and the hens, leaving just himself and Rex alone in the house now, and with the two gates coming into the yard, barred also, secured with two boxes of timber, tied from pillar to pillar, so that the postman had to climb up over the sod fence, walk down the path to shove the letters and the mass cards under the door, which was bolted. And all this happened before Annie's month's mind mass, by which time also he'd begun to show the first signs of really letting himself grow. He was growing a beard that bristled out from his jaws in a way that threatened to engulf his whole head. A genuinely shocking sight on a man who'd been clean-shaven his whole life, but who now, he wouldn't hear a word against it, saying that his father had a beard, and his father before him had had one. So too had our Lord, a better man than either of them. And if a beard was good enough for these men, it was good enough for him also. And it was at this point also when he really began to neglect himself. There was no eating and no wash or shave either and the same clothes on him day in, day out, and he grew thinner and thinner inside them, and the shirt was slack over his narrow chest and the trousers barely hanging on his hips. But the hair and the beard were still growing, thickening like a furze bush around his head, no fire or heat on now in the house anymore, so it got damp and filthy and black mould growing down the walls, and nothing but the smell of piss meeting me at the door, those few times he let me in to see him with a few bits and pieces. And I found him sitting there in the dark, all alone in the glare of the television screen, looking at Bosco or some other kid's shite on the television and a can of fly spray on the table. Dor Dorothy, would you like to? Yes, um, the text doesn't really have a beginning or real end. It's a conversation that just sets in and continues. So I'll read the first pages. Um, in sleep, said the translator, I once saw the mass of European mountains collapse. I lay there out of my senses, silent, heard sounds against this backdrop. The peaks broke up before my eyes, all slowly crumbling and rolling towards me as scree, stone flung through the air. I watched as the ridges were thrown into motion, fell to pieces, all flying at me. Later, I woke up. The room was empty, the heat on the highest setting. Unchanged lay the landscape before the windows, the entire night panorama, the faulted and piled stone. A.L. Erika said the place she was thinking of could not be reached by road. No, one could get there only on foot or on horseback. This place is a gorge through which a river flows, a fair amount of branches and greenery, fossils in the rock faces, the water completely clear like the Caribbean. Fortunat sat at the window and read. He had come to know the Alpstein on day hikes, central Switzerland and Carinthia too, he said. And again, cried the translator, I watched everything around me collapse. A sudden explosion flushed the Alps skyward. Slow and silent, I saw their peaks and spines falling at me. Hours later, someone entered the darkened room, lay down next to me, breathed deep. I shut my eyes. What did this portend and who was involved? Nothing special happened before. The logistics expert said just that I was dropping everything. It would all glide from my hands at that time and fall. I watched the things as they fell. I stood there quietly as they removed themselves from me in falling, thudding in the end. I said nothing. In such moments, the things became alien with increasing distance. I no longer saw the fork, the glass, and so forth as fork and glass. I instead saw only something lying in front of me, an object formed thus and such, with no relation to me whatsoever. I was not unsettled by this. It was all the same if, for instance, the glass shattered on the kitchen floor. The crash didn't frighten me. It was as if I had expected the sound or heard it only very distantly. As if the tale of such an event had long ago prepared me for it all. I hardly slept anymore, paced restlessly through the rooms, sat in the kitchen, lay down, was tired, but didn't sleep. A.L. Erika got up and walked behind her chair as if to begin an important lecture. 
When I walked the city now and again at night, she said, I thought about those who were sleeping. Th the thousand million sleepers lying in dark rooms, still and soft featured, how they moved in their sleep and breathed in the suburbs on the coast at the edge of the desert. The radio, continued the logistics expert, ran around the clock. The announcer spoke of 12 freezing deaths in Western Europe. The sky was blue. Upon the mountains lay the ever-present snow. People came and went across the border at this time, at every time. A day broke before the windows, then ended yet again, and darkness fell. Thank you. Um, so these are actually very different books, even though they're all brave books. Um, and I think that the thing that they share is a sensibility that, pit, that uh, potentially pits the individual against the dictates of society. And yet, of course, the individual is also of that society and sees himself or herself acting in relation to other bodies in that society. And it, that's, you know, there's a, there's a bravery inherent in potentially critiquing society when everything in a society tries to get you to conform to its structures and rules. And um, I'll just start with Mike. Um, the way you set up the theme of the individual as set apart from society and yet so much a part of it is, is really interesting. The main character is a civil engineer who at one point is asked to sign off on a concrete pour that isn't going to work. And the novel sort of shows that conflict between the character's work as an engineer against the demands of politicians and the way that they want society to run and their sort of power to like steamroll this, this individual, this engineer. Um, there's a moment where the narrator thinks, how come we never noticed those tensions building? Were we so blind to the world teetering on the edge that we never straightened up from what we were doing to consider things more clearly? Or have we lost completely that brute instinct for catastrophe, that sensitivity now buried too deep beneath reason and manners to register? Can you talk a little bit about how you came to look at the life of this man who has you know, a deep understanding of how the wor world is built in a material sense, but sees too that you know, politicians have so much control over what actually happens in it, even though he has more sort of information than they have? Yeah, the, Marcus Conway is the, the, whole the whole book is one voice, one continuous outpour from one voice, Marcus Conway. And Marcus is a, is a, is a public engineer. And uh, he's a public engineer that he's not involved in the pharaonic projects that, you, that maybe Americans associate with engineering. He's involved with the small-scale work, the, the little roads, the houses, the small bridges, and things like that. All the small stuff that bind communities together, that make communities, and that bind communities. And when the voice of Marcus came to me, it was, he, he, he came for several reasons. Firstly, I've, I've, I've always, you know, I've always had this conviction that engineers make the world, and um, and I've always had the conviction that that artists resent them for it. That uh, it should be us. It should be us poets that make the world. It should be us novelists that make the world. It should be us photographers. But actually, it's, it isn't. It's these rude mechanicals that make the world. And so I, I became convinced of that idea for you know over over 30 years ago when I was a student. And um, so I've always had this openness towards, if an engineer shows up here, I will listen to him, I work for him and that. And, um, and he, he showed up after 2008, after the arse had fallen out of the world, uh, uh, economically out of the world. And, and he showed up in, in, in kind of answer to a question, one of the things that, that one of the one of the bequests or the endowments that the, the, the Celtic Tiger had to Ireland was a load of crap buildings, a load of crap <laughs> developments. And I'd wondered what architects and engineers had been doing during that period, signing off on shit like this. So this so this man shows up and his name is Marcus Conway. And I got to talk about him, and, and I found he was, this is really interesting, he's not a private engineer, and he's not associated with the big things. He's doing the small things, and his job is to guide, his job is to look after the public good and the public purse, and he has to negotiate between politics and developers, all who want a cut out of whatever project is underway, all who want, and it's his job to steer these projects through to their best fulfillment to steer him through political considerations and economic considerations. And he has his work cut out. Because uniquely, actually, in, in the Irish democratic system, 
politics can trump engineering. Um, and a person can put a, an engineer can put through a, a project and a politician can swipe it and say, actually, no, we'll, we'll cite it over there because I'm badly in need of votes in that constituency. And when that water plant is opened up, I'll be there cutting the ribbon on it and I will be, and everyone will be shaking my hands and I'm going to keep, get a heap of first preferences. So I saw Marcus's voice. He's a private, that's just one strand of the book, this public political consideration. And he also talks about his wife and his love for his kids and everything like that. So I saw his voice as a private voice in a public realm, and that was what, what drew me to him. That and the fact that Marcus is, he's a middle-aged man, and he has a, he has a, broad, in, a broad interest in the world. He's, the, nothing seems to be foreign to his inquiry. And he's also, as well, no more than myself, absolutely astonished that he's alive at all when, when the odds are so hopelessly stacked against him being alive, as they are against each of us here being alive at all. Um, so he's, he, he speaks out of this public-private nexus, and he speaks out of astonishment. And, um, and that's where I got the... And he speaks out of my own conviction, I suppose, that, that engineers make the world. Wow. Yeah, and, and this interesting, you know, it's, it, it's interesting within that is an idea of power, right? The politician is the one with the power. And yeah, he, 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 he speaks about his world, he speaks about his, his, um, he speaks about his, wor his world as, his, he, he speaks of an engineer's lament that it's not engineers who are running the world, it's politicians. And he tells us, he tells us, he tells a joke in it, four or five men are standing around arguing, what trade is the oldest trade? And one of them is a lawyer, and he says, oh, you go back to Cain and Abel, there was a murder there, there had to be some sort of judicial process to sort it out. He says, obviously, lawyer and goes way back. And then a doctor says, oh, no, prior to that, there was, prior to that, there was um, um, uh, Adam and Eve and that whole birth and conception thing says there obviously had to be some sort of medical care and aftercare in there, so obviously <laughs> doctrine goes back further than that. And, and then uh, an engineer says, no, engineer is the first trade. Engineering is, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That's the primal act, engineering act. In, in, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth out of chaos. And the politician looked at him and he says, tell me, God created the heaven and earth out of chaos. That's as far back as engineering goes. And he says, that's as far back as it goes. And the politician says, he says, who do you think created the chaos? <laughs> so that was... That, I don't think I told that very well, but he, he was saying... That, that's, how, that's how far back politics goes. Politics is prior to engineering or all the other trades. So, and in one other aspect as well, he, he, he talks about how it, politics and politicians and engineers have a very different attitude towards the future and towards time. He argues that, he says to a politician, your decisions only have to stand up for four years until the next electoral cycle. He says, my, if my bridge falls in four years, I look ridiculous, my reputation is ruined. So they both have a gaze to the future, but an engineer has a much longer gaze into the future. And, uh, you know, the, the role of the individual set against her society is important in your book too, Laura, in which, um, you know, the seven women are from around the world and some of them face, you know, structural violence or violence at the hands of those with more power. Um, and you also have kind of a multivocal approach. Um, how did you become interested in, in this subject matter or conceive of this notion of the women um, storytelling after death? <laughs> Mm, it was first I saw this white empty space. I didn't know what I do with it, <laughs> but it was the starting point of this novel. And uh, my first novel called Scissors, it's not translated neither. Um, it, it is a, everything happens in one room, actually. It's an ad, the Roman, the, a novel that tells about adoption. A narrator is a woman who has adopted a little girl from China and she can't get communication. Uh, working on with her. So I thought with the second book I want to have many, many ladies there <laughs> inside my story and, and something more wide. And it gained white actually. And uh, 
then I just started to think what could happen if there is seven women in this white empty space, why they are there. So my writing starts from questions. It starts from some visual, very usually some visual uh, starting point, and, and then I start to figure out what could have happened. So I don't have a plot beforehand. And then everything goes by writing. That is important. I don't want to know where I go when I start to write. It's, it's uh, more interesting to me. And uh, there are some, all of these women have had a lot of struggles during their life. Uh, Maimuna from Senegal is really maybe the best example of a uh, victim of structural violence because she is kind of a vehicle of human trade and, and gets killed there. Uh, and Shlomi, who is a performance artist from New York, she makes art out of her, out of her anorexia. And she actually uh, gives a lecture which is part of the book titled as Anorexia and Judaism. She's Jude and she uh, wants to really make and explore what comes this disease. And she makes very strong arguments and provoking arguments, but uses uh, studies and exams to kind of support her argument. And she dies to her art, literally. And she's very conscious about what she's doing, but at the same time, she dies to it. So there is some huge black gap in her, in her thinking, in a way, because she doesn't do good to herself, even though she thinks that she's a real artist, hunger artist. And, um, well, everyone has some, some kind of uh, rough background, in a way, but I don't treat them as victims, because in this book, even they are dead, they get to tell their stories with the help of narrator, of course. Narrator is the eighth character in my novel. It's not he or she or somebody. It's like consciousness going somewhere there and helping them through this world of stories and storytelling. There are a huge amount of different background stories which are told. So, yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and thank you. Um, and the multivocality and the power themes, I think, are also in your work, Dorothy. Um, your interest uh, is kind of at how should we stand in relation to one another. And, you know, it, there's a lot about physical proximity, our ability to see sort of the humanity of another person when they're close to us, but maybe not as much when they're removed. And there's a lot of imagery of falling or like having control of the body. Um, what prompted, and, you know, and all that is connected to um, an interest in how different people are affected by borders and immigration. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to that subject matter? Well, I think um, I started writing the book at the point when I felt like um, there were more and more um, images showing up in newspapers and, and words um, that were being put in relation to immigration, um, asylum seekers that um, were more and more violent. Um, and I tried to figure out um, what that meant about uh, language and about the people using this language and also what it meant in relation to our lives. Um, all of like, the people living in Switzerland, for example, or Europe. Um, and if there would be, um, my question I think was, if there could be a way to write about this, to to um, like open up this 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 conversation that was going on in the public, um, not that I think that my uh, small book can <laughs> do that, but uh, as a, an experiment in thinking um, to to bring uh, complexity back into into. A, a discussion or a conversation. Um, and for me, that meant to approach um, this theme or this question from many different angles. Um, I didn't want to write a, a political manifesto. I was interested really in, in words and also in motives. I think that maybe images are what really keeps the text um, or links the fragments of the text um, 
I thought a lot about yes, what happens to bodies when they cross borders? Um, what, ha how do we sleep, for example? In what circumstances? How are we allowed to to live? How much do we? Um, uh, see or experience of what other people um, go through that might be our neighbors um, but in a in a very um, uh, maybe you could call it artificial way so there are just voices speaking they're not real characters I think they're just I always imagine them like actors on a stage just speaking their text so making kind of a um, in German, we say a carpet of, of text, like weaving. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and to what extent, you know, did you feel you were writing about something that some people in your society might, or your culture might not want to hear regarding, you know, the relationship of many Western societies to refugees, for example, refugees are like a contentious Point. Well, it's a strange thing. Um, I, this morning I read a, a, a passage from the book where there's also a writer that's part of this conversation and she says, well, I'm not, I can't finish this book that, that she's working on because um, this is becoming my capital as a writer that I'm like, taking this whole topic and, and writing something about it. And I think uh, um, that was a, a huge... Um, uh, question for me. So, of course, on the one hand, I think many people don't share my views at all, but I don't think that they necessarily know about this book. Um, and at the same time, in, in Switzerland or in the German-speaking countries, there is always this call for, you know, especially young writers to, to be more uh, political, to write uh, political things, to, to become some, try to become some kind of public uh, intellectuals. Um, and so, of course, um, that kind of fit very well um, in a way that I fulfilled this uh, expectation that I don't think that it's really, I think, you know, there's no imperative what one should write about. So, um, it's, I have a very complicated relationship to the book myself, I think. Oh, that's interesting. It, 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 what was the reception? What has the reception been for your book in, in it, Switzerland? It's been, it's been great. Um, but that itself um, makes it uh, kind of sad, you know, that there, it's, it's also, I, people talk, to me a lot. I, I've, I started writing the book 2010. Now people think it's like a commentary on um, what happened since 2014, 15. Um, and it's, it's, um, I'm very unhappy that it's still um, such a big um, topic also with the Mediterranean. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Laura, your, your book has a lot of you know, potentially taboo topics too, um, you know, with a, with a character who's a hunger artist and a teenage character um, who faces sexual violence. Um, how comfortable did you feel, you know, digging into what some people would think is transgressive or charged material and how did you, you know, prepare yourself for that or go into that? Yeah, that's, uh, that was, was a bit surprised when the book came out because, of course, I knew that Shlomit speaker because I'm not a Jew and, and that's not my cultural background. There are other figures that are for Maimuna is from Senegal. It's not my cultural background neither. But, and, uh, but the Jewish uh, subjects were so sensitive, of course, that I made a lot of uh, back research for it. And, for example, this... Uh, a lecture that Shlomit gives in the end of the first chapter called Anorexia and Judaism uh, is footnoted. I, I had a lot of references that I don't made up my own mind, the things I, I write there. So I was in that way I was prepared, but still uh, actually when this book came out, uh, it was 15, August 15, and it got Finlandia Prize and uh, it made me made this book I kind of everybody knew it kind of <laughs> and it was an maybe an easy target then because it was book that people talked about so it was um, I was the first speaker in Finland literature that uh, one um, author told that there is um, I, I'm 
of what is the word, cultural appropriation that I've been doing with this book. This is a little bit hard subject to me to talk now because it was so uh, aggressive, uh, the uh, kind of impact it gave. And I thought that uh, her argument was that I shouldn't write anything at all uh, for example, Jewish speaker, because I'm not a Jew, just the people like me should be my figures and my characters. And um, so it went in a very odd way from my perspective. But then I think the themes of cultural appropriation is interesting and I might write an essay about it in, in some year, but I want to collect more information about it, of course. But uh, that's what happened with Oneron. Yeah, no, right. and I, I can see it's probably been challenging. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's a big question here, which is, you know, should we draw any lines in what a fiction writer is allowed to say or talk about? And you and I were talking yesterday, that, or maybe I heard you say this in your other panel, that, um, that you purposely didn't include any Finnish characters in your novel because you didn't want to identify too much with one of the seven characters over the others. Exactly, because all of these women are uh, strange to each other and they don't share the same language. I wanted to be as an author in the same position. And, and I thought that if there would be a, a Finnish uh, <laughs> protagonist, it would be kind of unfair to this book to write from that perspective. I must be as strange as they are to each other's. So that was the poetic starting point for all this. So it, it was a little bit rough to say that I shouldn't write any, any of these figures because they are not finished. Right, right. And, it, and I mean, it's an aesthetic marvel, actually. The, the different stories relating to each other is, is kind of your point, right? Yes, the point exactly. Is the, is the multivocality. It is. Right, so. It is. Um, you know, and, and what do you think about that, Mike? In Solar Bones, there's much, there's you know, less of an interest in what's taboo and maybe more of an emphasis on how society works or doesn't work. But you do have a character, the engineer's daughter, who's an artist who maybe, maybe rubs her father the wrong way. You think or no? <laughs> <laughs> and something yeah. a counterpoint. He right? has well, one of the crisis moments in the book comes early when he is when Marcus, when Marcus goes to see his daughter's exhibition. She's a prize-winning student. As part of her prize, she goes to see, part of her prize is she gets to put on an exhibition in, in uh, she gets to put on an exhibition in a, in a public gallery. And he's previously known her work to be oil on canvas. Um, very gifted, uh, a very gifted worker with oil on canvas. But he goes to this exhibition and he walks in and he suddenly realizes that the, the wall is covered in blood and there's all this sort of testimony taken from court transcripts that are very local and from very close to where Marcus lives. And um, I, I, a strange, I, gave, I gave that book to the very first editor that read, uh, and he, sorry, he has a panic attack and it causes a real crisis in him. He says, Jesus Christ, he says, like, what is it, what torment is behind her that's driving this, or, or what vision in front of her is pulling her? Either way, it doesn't make me happy. And ha have I failed her as a father? And, 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 and when, did, when did this become passé? When did we, when did this become passé? And to me, his, to me, his anguish and his angst seemed entirely credible in that. But I remember giving it to an editor, and, and, uh, and an editor says, you know, what's wrong with him? What's he, what's, he, what's he going on about? And I, thought, gee, uh, and I thought, God, the world has moved on. Uh, I, I, um, I was thinking I, I, I'd be quite worried if I saw two pints of my daughter's blood up on, up on a wall, you know, in, in any context, in any guise and that. And it comes from my own, you know, that, that's, that's a long involvement that I've had in a long involvement and a long exposure, uh, a long fruitful involvement and exposure to visual artists. They, they, um, they recur in my work. Um, I've never written about a writer because they're they're dull, but artists are much more interesting. They're much more kinetic, much more tactile, and 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 they search in a different way. And I find that much more interesting than that. Um, but uh, I was glad to see that some. I was glad uh, a person came up to me yesterday about the book and and uh, drew that drew down th that incident in the book and said. He said, it's just what any father goes through with his daughter. <laughs> he didn't have to be an artist at all. It's just a, an aggravation of, 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 a, of a, father's, a father's watching his daughter grow in that. But the, the body, as a, the body as, a, as a political arena, 
and particularly women's bodies as a political arena has been a, has been a recurring, again, not something I've ever thought about, but it's been a recurring theme in my own work on that. And in Solar Bones, the, the central crisis in Solar Bones is when is based on a true incident in Ireland when the character comes down with cryptosporidiosis, uh, which is a, an infection you get from drinking contaminated water, and which had a big outbreak in Galway. And it precipitated all sorts of political upheaval, engineering upheaval, and everything like that. So those are the, that, those part of the, the, all that nexus that we, we, we talked about, the body as, as, a, as, a, as a political arena. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's the body, and it's also the body, you know, in relation to uh, other bodies or other people, you know, and it's kind of that pushback, right? Yeah. It, um, it, Marcus sees himself as 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 a man, you know, as a man among, as a man of the world, as a man among other people, and it's a book about one of the things that that I that this is an experimental novel and. It had its difficulties being published, getting a publisher, and and it's about a man, a man's voice. But at every stage, the book, when the book gradually found its way to publication, it was women who came to the aid of the book. Uh, my my wife was the first reader. My agent was the first person to say, "I think you're onto something here." And then it hit a long slew of men, one after another, who folded one after another, until it eventually arrived on the desk of two women in their early 30s. And they said, we go with this, this is brilliant. Uh, we can, we can uh, uh, to use their own expression, we can sell the shit out of this book. And, <laughs> and they were as good as their word. And, and I, I thought, I, I didn't say it, I thought, no, 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 what's gonna happen is what happens to every McCormick novel. It'll get good reviews and it'll fall over the side of a cliff. And that, but they went with it. Now. The, the thing is, I, I went to a, I went to a pub, uh, give a public reading in I gave a public reading uh, a couple of months after it was published in London, and a woman asked me a question. She got up and she says, "Wouldn't it be true to say that this novel is about faith?" Uh, she said that this is a story about a man who uh, turned his back on God, or God turned his back on him, and he turns around and he puts his faith in community and engineering and family and work and that kind of thing. And then she went on for 10 minutes to speak absolutely brilliantly about this book. This woman, I turned to, the, turned to, to, my, uh, turned to my interlocutor and I said, you asked this woman about the book, she knows more about it than I do and that. And I, 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 I didn't mean that, I don't mean that in any sarcasm or anything. She just had a brilliant read on it and she saw it as a book, this is about faith. This is, about, this is a book about faith. And um, I don't know what question I was answering there actually. <laughs> Yeah, no, and I was actually going to move on to death, which is kind of related maybe a little bit to faith too. Um, you know, mortality and, uh, you know, existence versus non-existence is important in all of the books, and you're connecting that to faith, but I think, you know, it's connected to sort of different um, substantive themes in the world. But, um, you know, both, all three of the books, I think, can even be seen as sort of meditations on, on life, what's common between people, um, and you know, it's not always language that's common between people or even you know, sort of experiences of power that are common between people. I think in Oneir on Laura, the, the different worlds of your characters sort of collide and, and uh, one of the characters at one point says, um, you know, as they're telling stories around what they think of as a campfire, she describes it as, we continue existing after death in little groups in emptiness and we gradually lose our senses, but not our ability to communicate, especially not our ability to quarrel. It's only in death that we see, you know, sort of a p potential reconciliation between these sort of different positions in the world and different positions in society, and that's, you know, an intriguing setup. Do you think, you know, knowing of our own death and knowing of the death of others, and, and Dorote also has this theme, should that um, affect how we view our role as writers and, you know, the risks we take as, you know, while we have time among other humans? Yeah, um, I think that death is actually the most basic question of writing because it's so hard to understand that we are going to die. <laughs> and for me, uh, I, I will continue with this theme uh, in my fourth book, maybe. I think so. Uh, but actually, I think that this whiteness here is also a metaphor for an empty paper, of course. And, and for me, it's very important that these women don't have anything except their memories and their reasoning with them anymore. So I have 
cleaned up the place and, and they have to kind of imagine everything. So it's kind of, kind of a book about writing in the end, which writing and dying are a very basic question of literature. And they actually um, put off their clothes in this empty space because they need to have a room. It's a dogville. Um, kind of uh, inspired session here. They make a, make the room out of their clothes, and then they are naked there. So they have to put everything away and think it again. So it's like a apology for crea creativity as well. I think so. Yeah. And and what would each of you say? You know, do you think that a writer has an an obligation to the world or to other people, or is there any? you know, mandate, or do you, do you have your own individual mandates, maybe? You talked about that a little bit before with your answers, but. Uh, I think I personally do feel an obligation, but I wouldn't uh, generalize that um, for all writers. I think there are lots of different uh, approaches and reasons to write. For me personally, yes, I think writing, um, wouldn't make a lot of sense if it weren't for other people. Um, for me, it's really um, communicating. I don't think the text is finished until it's being read. Um, and I really look at my text as some kind of messages uh, or letters I try to send out um, to to friends and maybe potential future friends um, also as kind of a conversation um, and I think it's it's um, it's always an essay in the literal sense of the word trying to understand some things and I think usually I would say that happens um, not alone but um, in conversation with others um, somehow still I end up by myself at the desk but I think it's only um, still out of this urge um, to communicate, to ask questions and to, to find answers. And I think for me these questions are always, there are no um, truly private questions. They, they concern this place we live in and the circumstances that we create for us and for others. Right. Um, you know, and I, I think about this a lot. I think about how, you know, sometimes some authors try to make the language more accessible because the the content is maybe, um, they're worried that nobody will read <laughs> their books because they took formal risks. But all three of you took a lot of formal risks. And, um, you know, Shift Sleepers struck me as, as very uh, formally risky because sometimes the characters are talking past each other. How did you elect a form like this, you know, an extended conversation in which some characters are not directly, you know, what, what prompted that thought that not all the characters are directly talking to each other in a narrative, you know, in what we think of as a traditional narrative way, but almost, uh, you know, kind of breaking the novel form a little bit that way? Well, I think that's uh, owed to my perception of of the world and my reading, my, my I think it's a fragmented way of, of, of talking, um, and it's also a failing so I think they are they fail all the time they try to express things they fail and then they start again um, so I think that's the reason uh, for the gaps that there are or for the um, l lacking pieces um, but I think that's how um, conversation works actually and I think it has has a beauty in it but it's true Absolutely. that it's a it's a it's a great risk um, um, it's, I think the whole form of the book um, causes a lot of irritation and also, <laughs> interestingly, aggressions because it's, um, I think in school, you know, we learn to answer the W questions, who, who where, why, uh, when, and I understand that if one can't instantly answer these questions, there's a frustration maybe or an insecurity of not understanding and I think that's a risk the book has to take. Right. And, and Mike, you know, in Solar Bones, the novel is written as, you know, one long sentence and thoughts are almost written with like poetic enjambment. And it reminded me a little bit actually of Virginia Woolf. You're talking about James Joyce. And I know that all the critics are yeah. comparing it to James Joyce, but there's an interiority and a, you know, one person's interior feel yeah. to it, the way that the sentence is, it's one sentence, but the, their breaks are yeah. almost poetic. Um, can you talk a little bit about what uh -huh. made you chose that form? 
I was interested in what my colleague said here. You, 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 you spoke about how your book didn't really have a beginning, or, or, or and uh, and that's the way people say that this that solar bones is is a sentence, uh, and and actually it's it's not if you look at it because it it drifts onto the page and it fades out on the last page. So there's no capital letter at the beginning and there's no full stop at the end. So to the best of my knowledge, it's a fragment of a lot of a sentence that extends before the book was opened and after the book closes. It's not a complete book at all. Uh, in fact, it's just a fragment uh, of a book. And um, it, it's, it's the second of my uh, interest, again, in what you were talking about, people being irked uh, about the shape of your book and that, because it's, it's the second experimental novel that I've done. Uh, and the previous one, Notes from a Coma, was the antithesis to this. Uh, this is one man with a single outpour. And the previous book was six narrators, a uh, multivocal novel with a running commentary. And it was called Notes from a Coma. And there was a, an obligation on the reader to step in and to sequence and to make sense of the, out of the book in some ways or other than that. And, and uh, critics got, a couple of critics like, you know, remarked on the book thematically and that it was this, that, and the next thing. They said there was, you know, there was, uh, they said it's very bitty and it's broken up. And, and they're going, yeah, it's, it's the, you know, the hint is in the title. It's called Notes from a Coma. It's not called Continuous Linear Narrative from a Coma and that. So, you know, so, so, so you know, don't put it, criticize me for a book I didn't write and that. Um, so, it, 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 but for me, for me, the, the, the experiment, uh, for me, the experiment, the, for me, the experiment in, in Solar Bones isn't the formal experiment or the technical experiment. For me, the experiment was, was the thematic experiment. This is a book about a white, middle-class, middle-aged man who's happy in his life and his work and who loves his wife. Make a novel out of that. Uh, that's, that, to me, was the harder proposition. Uh, that, to me, was the bigger risk. And the ending is given away right at the beginning. And so how do you pull off the ending? So, so the... the, the the risks were, I think, different to what people think. Uh, 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 the, the form of this book, I, I never considered that to be the experiment. Although, yes, I can see how people would say that. I always consider the theme. Uh, I always consider the theme and the character to be a much more, to be a much riskier um, option. Yeah, and that makes sense because the literary tradition you're writing from with Flann O'Brien and uh, James Joyce, it, this is very much of a piece with that. So it's not breaking with that tradition, right? No, it's not, um, and and, uh, and 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 it's it's it takes its inspiration from that tradition. Um, you know that they, they, I think they, I, gave, I think they gave us this heroic endowment and bequest, and this kind of a responsibility on us to go forth and experiment. And that uh, I think that that's they gave us this license to do that. And and um, it'd be nice to think that this solar bones honored that kind of commitment in some way. Yeah, absolutely, um, and. Oneron is, uh, it's partially a traditional narrative, but it's also got these pieces, like it has newspaper clippings and it has, um, you know, a sort of fairy tale at one point and, you know, just these stories colliding against each other. And I think, uh, you know, that's very interesting. And I don't, I don't know to what extent, you know, Natalie Sarot kind of has, has influenced or not influenced no, you, no. but, you she, know. she doesn't write anything else but tropism. <laughs> so, oh, okay, okay. So, and, and very, actually the same book all the time. So it's very different than my, my thing. Experimenting <laughs> yes. with the forms. Yeah, so what was the thinking behind using different forms? It's almost like you're using the, you're trying to get at a, uh, an idea from multiple different angles. Can you talk a little bit about developing that yeah, one? Um, yeah, there are many different genres inside the book. There is one poem, which I didn't write myself because I'm not a poet, but I asked one of my good friend to write it to me there. And then there is, for example, theatrical text with the dialogue and fairy tale and lectures with food notes and without food notes and a lot of that kind of stuff. And it's not uh, like I want to be kind of experimental per se. It's, it's more that I wanted to uh, kind of express something from the characters, how they, what is their spirit, what is their temperament. And for example, Rosa Immaculada, who is from Brazil, she has a very, very kind of acting out temper temperament, and, and that's why she is put in a drama form. So it came from the characters, not like I want to just mix some genres in the novel. Yeah. 
you know, and I think partly to take, you know, all these, you're taking different kinds of risks, but whether you're brave in terms of form or content or both, you kind of want to know that there's adventurous readers out there willing to take the plunge with you. Um, do you, do you have, this is for all of you, do you have any advice on how to cultivate that kind of adventurousness in your reading life or your writing life, depending, I'm sure there's a mix of, you know, staunch readers, staunch writers, both in the audience, do you have any advice on cultivating sort of the adventurousness? Because you each have an, uh, you know, each of these books is very much an adventure. I, I was I was thrilled today to go down to the market and I and I Why saw. Oh yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> I was talking to myself again. <laughs> I was thrilled today to go down to the market and and I saw a man with a with a bookshop with a little pile of books there. And he had one of he had various variations of one of my my own favorite novels, um, J. G. Ballard's *The Atrocity Exhibition*, which is one of the great avant-garde experimental novels. On that, and was that was one of the books that kind of set me on my way as a oh we can do this with form. This is this is legitimate to write like this. It's legitimate to be this outré and. Um, and uh, all of the, the, the technologies and the futurisms that, he, that J. G. Ballard mapped out. So it was kind of, it was, uh, I don't know, it was just a really nice thing to go down today and see that. I think that book above any book in many ways, because it's such a cranky experiment. And, and, uh, and, uh, to, but just to see it down there in, in the market today was a, was a nice moment. I was down there with, with, my, with, uh, with Saul, my little boy, and we, <laughs> we made him balloon man. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, what I hope for myself as a reader um, is to be bold in a way um, that, for example, I have, I have two brothers and one sister and they don't really read a lot. But when I publish something, they kind of have to read it. But <laughs> because I'm just their sister, they, they're absolutely not afraid of not understanding anything because then they'll just come up to me and say, what, what does that mean? Or why did you write this and that like that? So there is, there is, um, there's this secure, um, how do you say it? They're not insecure readers because they're not afraid of also um, embarrassing themselves. And I, I always hope to be a reader like that um, and to see that the promise that also lies in, in the things that I don't yet understand, maybe, but maybe will. Yeah. yeah. I think that for me, novel is a form of, form of exploration, not a storytelling in the first place. I don't kind of very much, I'm not very interested in stories. In fact, I'm more interested in framing and novel is a proposition for something. And uh, if there is a very unique way to do it, then it's interesting. Otherwise, the, this world is full of stories and I can read them from newspapers as well or looking from television. The novel is a place where the language is tested every time again. So that makes uh, me curious about books. I'm quite picky when I read. I don't read much, but I choose very, very carefully what I want to feel, uh, will feel in my mind. <laughs> yeah. So you, you pick books based on their framing, is what you're saying? Framing or uh, what is the narrator voice? For example, nowadays, now, now recently I have been reading uh, Mac Maggie Nelson's books because they have been translated oh, in, yeah. in fin Finnish uh, just in, in this year. And I really love Argonauts and Amsluets. And I feel that I want to sleep with these books. I want to be near to them because <laughs> they kind of talk to me. And I want to be in a communicational relationship with books. I don't want to follow. I want to participate somehow. I want my mind to be deranged. So she does yeah. that. I love her. <laughs> I love her too. Yeah. You know, she's, a, she's unsettling in a, in a very like compelling way. Yes, yes. Um, I think there's, we should ask, ask the audience if they have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I think uh, she'll come over uh, with the mic. I first want to say thank you because I'm kind of struggling as someone who's written a few books with some of the things and I felt like you guys have helped me out. It's nice to hear other writers. Um, I think, Mike, um, something you said, I as a writer, I'm, I've written fiction, nonfiction, and journalism. I have all those books out and I'm finding myself right now writing about something that is very true 
and, and hasn't been uh, like a documentary type of journalism book, right? But then, of course, as I'm researching and writing like an author, voices come to me. And I'm having a lot of difficulty struggling between my roles as a journalist and my moral calling as someone who feels and who is being pulled along by whatever you would want to call the muses of the spirits. And I'm finding myself with my publishers being confronted with people saying, you really should just produce this book of journalism or you can't call it exactly, like telling me that my, my boxes are inadequate. And I wanna know how you've handled that, especially when, when you have publishers saying, essentially, well, we think it, it should either be this thing or that thing. And I've kind of gotten my answer, which is I'm gonna write for the readers who are gonna follow me on my journey. But, thank you for that. But at the same time, I wanna know what you think, if this resonates with you. Yeah, it, very quickly, it does, because one of the things that the, that the book went through, my agent to this day will not tell me how many, uh, how many publishers turned it down. Uh, okay, he says that won't do you any good knowing that. But but she, one of the things, one of the things that and, and you make it, it's a really important point, and, and I'd, I'd be really interested to see how 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 my colleagues here fared in their respective territories. But one of the things that the, that the that Trump press um, convinced me of, he said, is that he says we love the book and we're utterly convinced that there is an audience out there for this book. So they not only had faith in the book, they had faith in, the, in that there was a readership out there for it. And, um, and I, I didn't say anything, but I, I thought it was a long shot. Um, but they've been proved to be correct. And they, they said that says it's one, of the besetting sins, one of the besetting sins of the publishing industry is that they have no faith in readers. Uh, and, and that they don't put enough faith in them and that. And, and this is one of the things that has distinguished uh, Trump Press is that they've, they've taken experiments and they've run with them and they've been shown to be correct in their, in their evaluation. Now, I don't know if, you, I don't know if, you, um, if it's the same in this, in this part of the world, but in Britain and in Ireland, there's been a kind of an, a resurgence of, of small presses who are doing brilliant work. Uh, who are putting the bigger houses to shame because the bigger houses are clogged up with generations of older writers uh, and newer writers who are writing, who are not that formally experimental or thematically experimental. And it's the small publishers like Tramp Press and Fitzcarraldo and um, so on and so forth, that, and Lilliput and that, who, are, who have done the things. So I, 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 I'd start thinking about, about you know, just think, just write the book. And 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 it, hopefully the book will meet its proper publisher. I wish you well in it, because I know what it is like to have books going around the world for sport and that. <laughs> how did, how did, how yes, no, I think it's absolutely true. I'm right now um, have been talking with publishers um, about my next book, and I think it's not a novel. Um, it's more like a protocol of sorts, but. Um, one of them especially said, no, we, there's no way we have to write novel on it because they still believe that only novels sell. But then if you talk about Maggie Nelson, for example, or Annie Erno, which is being translated into German now again from the French, they're hugely popular and, and it's not what you would generally call novels, but that the big publishing houses, they still cling to these. Boxes. They really like categories. There's a there's an Irish writer called Keith Ridgway, and he wrote a book called. He wrote a book. Help me out, someone. Uh, what was his, what was Keith's last book called? Anyways, it's a book that uh, Hawthorne and Child, and it was a book that that seemed to be a book of short stories and seemed to be a novel, and it didn't seem to satisfy either criteria, and it did really well, uh, precisely because of that. And I, so I asked him in a public on a public forum, very much like this. I says, Keith, novel or book of short stories? And he said, he said, we sat down. He said, I sat down and I said, I had this discussion with my editor. And he says, do you know what we decided in the end? Do you know what we decided to call it? Guess? He said, a book. Yeah. That's, what we, that's what we decided to call it at the end, a book. And, um, yeah, and it's 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 pretty much a part of all those 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 books that have come out in recent years that seem to fl they don't seem to satisfy any criteria. And as we see that novel can be almost anything, 
uh, you know, experimental history and, and context. So I don't think that there is a, some idea what novel is. You have to explore it all the time. And then it's, is, is, it, good, is it good writing or bad writing? <laughs> the question is that simple in the end. For, for example, I will, my fourth book will not be novel. There will be a lot of pictures in it and writing, but it's not historical books, book, it's not essay, anything like that. But still, I want to kind of break all the rules with it, because, because otherwise it's not worth of writing. <laughs> do, do we have any other questions? Okay. Um, I think we're almost at time. I'm supposed to make an announcement. Um, that at 7 p.m. at the Freight and Salvage, the festival will screen a new documentary on famed journalist Robert Shear. Wristbands are valid for this program or priority tickets are only $10 as usual. I wanna thank our panelists, who I think are pretty incredible, and I really hope that you'll go check out their books because, I mean, these are like psychic adventures and, and everyone should be sort of challenging themselves, I think, to check out these books. It's gonna be amazing, thank you. <laughs>